Uh, hey everyone, my name is uh, Sandeep Patil. I work on Android systems team uh, in Google. I wanted to talk to you, to everyone, and basically tell you about uh, and how we are manage, maintaining Linux kernels uh, with respect to Android. How has Android progressed from? We talked about similar things last year at Plumbers as well. The things that we've done uh, over the past year, the things that we are continuing to do, and, and the changes that we've made to the process, to uh, to how we work, to uh, uh, and to basically even in terms of contribution. We also uh, discuss uh, the problems that were talked about last year and over the last year about Android and how Android manages kernel. What uh, pitfalls or what problems we have when we're dealing when we're dealing with kernel that is basically outside of the Android platform. Uh, to get into that, uh, so basically the overall agenda that I wanted that I just split in about four different parts is life of an Android device kernel. This is actually talked about, written in very much great details by none other than Greg even on Android.com, for example, about why. Uh, Android kernels are the way they are, how they start, how they uh, continue to be maintained in term, and why do, for example, to answer, to try to answer actually a, sim a simple question about why does an Android device basically end up starting with a kernel that's already two years old and why does it never catch up? Uh, so the li life of device kernels is basically uh, a simple diagram that I wanted to walk everyone through and uh, set the base of uh, the problem, and then we go into details about specifics in the Android problems, followed by the changes that we've made and are in the process of making in order to solve them. Uh, our kernel development process, uh, Project Treble was one of the biggest undertaking Android took from Android Oreo and Android Pie, for example, and that has affected how we do kernels as well and how Android interacts with kernel. What are the expectations for Android as a platform from kernel and vice versa as well. So we go into details for that as well. And, uh, and then we'll, I'll probably gonna have a lot of time for questions as well at the end. Oh. All right. So that's the life of an Android device kernel, for example. If this diagram has been repeated about five times over already. It's also on the sourceandroid.com. The easiest, but the part that I want to uh, basically elab elaborate on in terms of the Android device kernel is the third line in this. Uh, uh, pretty much Android common is the kernel that we maintain. Uh, Long-term stable is something that's maintained by Greg, for example, upstream. Uh, we know uh, Android common kernel, whenever LTS release is declared, we basically start the Android common kernel to patch it with the out of tree Android patches. And that process is fairly quick. It has been reduced down to uh, weeks the, compared to months now. And we're going to talk about that later uh, as well about how we ended up doing that. But the third line here is the most important. That's the kernel that basically can run on the hardware that's going to show up in an Android phone. Because that's the very first time, for example, uh, let's walk to you, uh, let me walk you through a, say, an SOC lifetime. Well, Arn actually talk, touched about it uh, briefly in his previous talk. Like all embedded devices end up running two year older kernels. The reason is because uh, if I'm a hardware manufacturer, I'm specifying an SOC. I start with the specification, probably an RTL design, an emulator. And most of the manufacturers are pretty good at keeping up with what is upstream, uh, what is mainline kernel. So they follow Linux's branch plus whatever out of three changes they have. They keep merging from, uh, from RC to RC or each major or minor version to minor version. Uh, as long as they're validating the emulator and RTL designs. As soon as, for example, the chip tapes out though, that kernel is now, that kernel is actually used to validate if the chip is working right. Uh, a lot of times, Android itself is actually used to validate whether that chip is working okay or not. And there's a significant advantage here because that means your bring up is actually done before this chip is out and then you're confident enough because you've been doing it generation over generations that uh, the software is right uh, and mostly uh, accurate to be able to validate how the hardware is coming out to be. Uh, 
So there are, for example, even in, let's say, factory setup, your, uh, well, not only it's kernel and some command line tools, it's kernel and Android booted, and, people, and yeah, I've even seen ADB commands run in order to validate a particular hardware. So and the, all of that is possible because the SOC manufacturer in this case started well, using the upstream kernel right when it was in the RTL phase. Uh, but now that they've done so much when the chip came out, it, is, it becomes, uh, uh, plus the Android bring up has happened, that's when the, these SOCs now start getting into uh, a boards, uh, reference devices and the boards that basically probably will end up in a phone. Uh, that, after that point onwards, it is uh, considered a lot riskier proposition, for example, to basically overall all the software from kernel upwards, including Android, in order to, base, in order to make a phone. So what ends up happening is most of the manufacturer end up snapping to the long-term stable kernel, that was that is the latest at that time because they've been following the main line until then. Uh, usually around the end of the year, uh, long-term stable kernel is declared, and so that's the kernel that they end up snapping to. Uh, let's put a fake timeline. Let's say that happened at the end of 2016, and 2017 at the beginning of 2017, basically they snapped to that kernel. They merged. Android patches from Android Common, if you will, because we get requests too about how do we run Android with this kernel. And now that SOC kernel is basically frozen in time in terms of uh, kernel major and minor version. The, the actual product from that SOC is what we call the device kernel, because now that SOC gets put on the board and an OEM or an ODM starts making uh, products with it, which again is a long cycle with many uh, stakeholders in between, whether it's carriers, whether it's uh, uh, factory, whether it's um, uh, so that process. The latest, for example, what we what you would see that SOC on in a device at let's say from the 2016 timeline, let's say about Q2 2018. So if that one started with doing all the things right that they could with the latest LTS that was available to them at the point of time the SOC was made. The only, the first device with that SOC actually showed up in about a year and a half later. Uh, which means uh, with the two year LTS, you're already close to end of life and your kernel support is gone by the time you launch an Android device. Uh, and that's basically how Android device kernels get made up. And pretty much every single one of them is different, even though they ultimately started at the same point of origin in LTS. We don't change uh, the Android common kernel nearly as enough uh, after, for example, a particular, the number of features that are required for a particular Android desert release. Uh, sorry. And uh, basically, uh, it's, that means your, every single Android device has its own kernel, if you will. Even, even if it's the same SOC because it gets modified if, every which way along the way. Uh, well, and base. So that basically breaks down into multiple problems that uh, have been again discussed. But I'm going to reiterate this and stressing on some point here. So what ends up uh, that that entire process ends up creating, for example, Android devices have older kernels. Uh, I think I, I just talked about why that is, but it, in some cases it's also older than two-year-old kernel. For example, an, uh, an SOC is not necessarily tied to uh, the time of life in the market. The same SOC that I shipped a device with in 2018, there's no reason why a new device in 2019 can't be re re reconfigured with the same SOC. So that SOC lives longer. The longer it lives, the older kernel you're seeing on Android devices as well. So it's not only just two-year-old, it can be three-year-old even. Uh, we're uh, uh, managing multiple kernel versions. This is something that we uh, end up dealing with every time. Android as a platform, I think about two years ago, literally made uh, a single statement about what it needs from kernel, which is that it should have a binder driver. And that's it, pretty much. So what that ends up doing, uh, making is there was no, uh, so you would see kernels from 3.2 to 3.4 to 3.14, 16, 18, or, and 4.4.4.9, all sorts of them. And what that means is now that platform cannot make any assumptions whatsoever uh, in terms of what kernel it will be running on. So if I want to use the latest and greatest feature that was added in, say, 4.9 kernel, uh, and I want to make sure I can use it on all the Android devices 
as an Android platform developer, I cannot make that assumption. So my so the Android platform code ends up having this spaghetti where oh if it's if if this is supported, make sure you can use this. If this is not supported, make sure you can use that, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that just makes it even more complicated. Uh, the slower non-existent kernel updates is uh, is uh, the other problem because of how those kernels flow downstream into Android devices. Uh, even if, for example, uh, stable kernels have update uh, get get pretty much weekly updates, we've been merging into Android comments. It's really difficult because of the large amount of Android uh, out of tree code for those updates to be merged into the SOC and down into the device tree, uh, device, uh, device kernels. But even that, I think we've come around to come around to solve, and I'm gonna talk more about that later as well. The biggest problem after that is basically making those updates available to users on the, in the field. And for that, uh, now basically, there are multiple logistical hurdles, uh, hurdles, that, hurdles that always come around, which is around uh, security. Like, how do we know that this, if you're having, say, 200 bug fixes, then uh, how do we validate these 200 bug fixes are not breaking something that is crucial, whether it's performance, whether it's an actual bug. And we've taken steps to, in order to give that confidence to everyone, whether it's carriers, whether it's OEMs and ODMs, in order to feel confident that LTS changes as they're flowing into their kernel are being tested every, along, every which along the way. Uh, Fourth problem, there is, as of last year, there was no continuous integration for kernels with respect to Android. Uh, uh, there's a patch if, let's say, mainline get updated from RC1 to RC2. The Android testing for that kernel is voluntary. I think Amit, who does a great job of maintaining AMT on uh, android.googlesource.com, uh, for example, he would test, go and test an Android device or Android board that he has available, like a high key, and would manually put it. So there's uh, and there is literally no CI, and this is true even if we have four or five kernel versions, there is nothing that verifies that a patch in the kernel can, let's say 414 kernel, when we don't have a 414 device at hand, can work with Android. There's, it's basically, it's there, it's a patch, it's a forward port from 4.9 to 4.14, for example, but there is nothing that can verify that as of today, and we're fixing that too. Uh, Fifth problem, uh, and this is one of the biggest complaints uh, uh, we would hear from uh, kernel developers, and we also have the same problem even as Android kernel or platform developers, is that we can't run or test mainline kernels with Android today uh, because there is no device that would have a mainline kernel running. Uh, the latest you would find is about one and a half year old LTS kernel being run on, uh, on one of the latest flagship devices, for example. Uh, and last but not the least, which I think everyone knows about, is millions of lines of out, out of free code. Uh, there are two contributors to it, obviously. One is us from Android, because we also have, tend to have a bunch of out of free code in Android Common. And of course, then there is the hardware specific code that supports each SOC or uh, boards alike. So let's get into each one of them one at a time. Uh, older multiple kernels, like I said, when until two years ago, we didn't have any of this. About around uh, Oreo, uh, I think uh, I talked. We talked about we have Android devices that basically get launched with Oreo. We have a 318.44 and 49 uh, requirement of such. So, for example, if a device is being launched with Oreo, it can't be on a kernel with a kernel that is any older than 318. Now, again, 318 is still about three years old at the Oreo time, by the way, uh, or maybe two years old at Oreo time. Um, but it's still better than having Oreo devices with 3.4, because it gives, it reduces your data set immediately. Uh, that happened. Uh, with Pi, we stepped it up a notch because we wanted to make sure all the updates that we are doing, whatever contributions we are making, uh, the LTS changes are actually showing up on Android devices, because once a device was launched with, say, 4.4Y, there was nothing that basically checked or had any use for, well, well, not use, any check for those devices being upgraded to a later stable kernel version. So what we did in order to uh, kind of mitigate that is with Pi, we added the stable patch version at the end of each of minimum kernel versions. So instead of saying the minimum kernel should be 4.4 or 4.9 and 4.14, we are now saying 4.4107 plus, 4.984 plus, and 4.1442 plus. So uh, the 4.984 is pretty much what you would end up seeing in most of the 
flagship devices, for example, which is still, again, that one and a half to two years delay from the main one. But the good part about it is the LTS patch versions are down to months than years older instead of, so, and there's a story about 107 and why that happened. So well, we've been doing this for about two years with Greg and there's exactly one occasion when we found a bug in stable kernel that because the fear has always been uh, oh, if we take stable kernel, and which is like 50 to hundreds of patches every week, we never know what bugs and regressions it's going to introduce to users and devices because uh, because we don't want to regress devices. That's basically the argument that you would get from updating the kernel. But uh, we've been doing this for about two years, and uh, there was exactly one occasion, and which is why that 44107 happened instead of 44126, I think. Because in 44108, unfortunately, there's a bug that got introduced in one of the USB controllers, which we found out through the CI that I'll talk about. And then that got fixed. We reported that got fixed in 44128, but we just didn't have enough time to basically update and run the whole test and triage and everything. That's why it was stuck at 44107. Uh, right, so that at least gets us to having a minimum, say, LTS patch version, which is months older than what it is today, which is great. Uh, but the problem of Android must continue to work with following kernel version still doesn't solve. With Pi, we can expect the kernels, though with the device launched kernels, will be at least 4.4 4 and plus. But we still have updates. We obviously want users and everyone to upgrade Android devices from uh, Oreo to Pi or Nougat to Pi, for example. In those cases, we still, as a platform, have to continue working with older kernels. That's why I highlighted 4.9, 4.14, 4.19, uh, taking a progression from, year on, uh, from uh, a year from now. But we still have to continue working with 3.18 and 4.4. We can't just assume a new feature introduced in 4.9, even though 4.9 is the minimum kernel version, let's say, uh, is going to exist in all Android devices. You have, so the code, the platform code still doesn't go away. So the platform deprecation effectively is about six years or five, five to six years instead of three years, even if you have kernels. Uh, adding CI, a few things happened uh, since last year, or they were in process even when we talked about it last year as well. But there, uh, uh, we've been working with Linaro. There's a uh, portal called qareports.linaro.org. And we've been reporting uh, the kernel function test, which is a part of, uh, which uses a test suite that we added, uh, that we introduced as part of Project Trouble, and, and many more. And it tests uh, the Linux uh, mainline, I think, Next, RC, and Stable, and reports all of those, uh, uh, all of those test results to the mailing list. Uh, this is the first, I think, uh, I don't know if it was the first time, but we are, I think, uh, this is running ARM. Uh, 32, ARM64, x86, and as many ARM hardware as we, uh, we can get hands on in order to test upstream kernels to make sure like boot and tests and all of those sanity checks are not basically breaking. Kernel CI has been doing this. I think everyone knows about Kernel CI. Kernel CI also tests downstream into Android common kernel. For example, once LTS release is made, uh, it gets merged into Android common kernel, so that's where it gets tested again with LKFT as well as with Kernel CI. Uh, with Kernel CI, we get boot coverage on about, I think, 200 plus boards. We've been contributing to the Linux test project uh, ourselves. We've been introduced, uh, adding more and more tests for system call. And this is basically not to, uh, this is basically testing for correctness. We want to make sure uh, when our Android as platform is expecting a system call to work in a way and return, an error, return a particular error in a way, it does that on all devices. Uh, because if that, or let's say a proc file is not changed in a way that now suddenly something can't parse because there's a new field added in the device kernel in a certain proc file, for example. So we've been doing that. The pre-submit testing on Android kernel uh, is something that we're starting up. Uh, we've started builds with it and we're starting up with pre-submit. So all those tests are now, we are running on Android kernel with something called Cuttlefish. 
uh, and this is something that I wanted to uh, let everyone know, kernel, kernel developers and Android developers alike. It's a target that is available as of today in AOSP, for example, which you can build. It's like an emulator, but not an emulator, because it behaves like an Android device. It's not intended only to, say, test apps. You can treat it as an Android device, like, a, like your phone. It will show up as a phone on your x86 laptop, laptop x86 workstations, and you can run Android with it. And the best thing about Curlfish is you can run Android kernels by default with it. And I think, if correct me if I'm wrong, I think you can even run mainline kernels without any changes, Alistair, or maybe there are a couple of changes uh, that we are working on documentation to make sure Curlfish runs mainline kernels. That's how we are planning to test those um, uh, Android kernels to make sure we can test I'll uh, say an Android Pi, an Android Oreo, to make sure they continue to work with older and newer kernels and all of that. So there's a big matrix. If you look, if you expand those combinations, I think that matrix basically end up having like 30 or 40 cells with Android releases versus kernel versions and whatnot. Uh, and that we are uh, planning to start doing uh, with uh, pre-submit. So every change that goes into Android kernel, whether it's an LTS merge, uh, it basically goes through some sanity checks on all of this, with all of these combinations, uh, followed by maybe a weekly or uh, bi-weekly post-submit test where we actually run longer tests, with including things like CTS and uh, uh, CTS to make sure nothing is break, uh, nothing is broken. Uh, and lastly, uh, we have uh, also been working with uh, SOC vendors where we basically send out releases, uh, release emails every time we merge LTS. Like, hey, can you guys also merge this and test and report us any problem you have? Well, and if you're reporting problem, can you tell us uh, what exactly the test you run? And so more likely than not, we want them to make sure we can reproduce it if at all possible. Uh, and I think apart from merge conflicts, I don't remember seeing a single report where, again, LTS or Android Common end up, ended up breaking downstream. Correct me if I'm wrong, Gregory. Yeah, I don't remember. So the only, the, the, the biggest part we get to know about it is conflict, for example. Oh, so then we can ask, hey, why is this changed? Uh, can we do it, uh, do it in a better way? And this basically means uh, they have the freedom to do it, do their testing, and they also can come along as we are merging kernels. So when we are saying Android Pi requires a 44107 patch version, that version is already merged and tested by them like weeks before we actually end up saying, you know, that's the one that we're probably going to decide on. Because we get test results back and say, oh, everything looks good and nothing is. Uh, and then we have pretty much uh, very much uh, confident testing about our own, uh, across the partners in order to make sure uh, that is not that is going to be okay. I think uh, the, uh, US, uh, the host controller bug was also found that way. Right. Uh, the kernel updates. Uh, it's like I explained, it's still a huge issue with carriers and vendors alike. With carriers, it's part of the safety about the number of changes. Even though vendors are now taking LTS updates, they st uh, still don't necessarily want to uh, uh, want to update a, uh, update a device that's actually shipped. So basically, they're breaking off point instead of launching their SOC is now launching a device. So we've ended up managing uh, we, we managed pushing that boundary to a launch of a device instead of launch an SOC, but after launching the device is still something that we need to continue to work on because after that, when if you want to do, say, an upgrade from 4.4 to 4.9, there's literally, uh, the question is always uh, why? Why can't we continue taking LTS updates? And even if we do take LTS updates, then how do we make it make sure that they show up on devices? So I think so we are planning to concentrate mainly on the getting those stable kernel updates onto the devices first. Uh, right, so as part of uh, that, so for launch, we can do, we can make sure minimum kernel version is there. So we know we have a limited set of kernels that we have to manage for any given desert release. So Pi also introduced uh, LTS. We are planning to continue moving this needle with T, uh, increasing the LTS intake even after a device launch. Obviously, we are planning to lead by example ourselves. And then the biggest step would be also make these stable updates as part of the whole security process, because that's the, that's the goal. If we can prove that uh, the, that, that devices can sustain this, because then uh, 
a bug is a bug. I think I think Greg said that. I don't remember who said it. A bug is a bug is a bug. There's no security uh, or security bug as such. It's they're all bug fixes, and you can trust them. They're safe. They're be, they've been tested everywhere along the way, and you should really not worry about them. And if there is a bug happen, it's software, but it happens even today. It happens. So we're not increasing the probability in any way than a normal security update would on a given device, for example. That's basically where we're headed. Uh, other problem, no testing tar targets. Kernel developers, for example, hey, why would I, this is a very common thing that I've seen, I've, I've read myself on the mailing list, for example, hey, oh, I'm running Android, but how do I run um, the, the latest kernel on Android? Because that's who, that's what I send my patches against. You can probably go one version list, two versions list, but you're still, no, even if, People, developers are probably okay with having latest LTS running Android device in order to test their changes, but even that doesn't happen because let's, I mean, for now, it's about a year and a half. So basically, that becomes a big turn off. Like, there is no way I can test Android with my changes to make sure I didn't break anything, even a simple regression test. Uh, problem being, and, and it's the same problem for us, like how do we test if we're adding a change in Android, how do we test it against the latest kernel to make sure we're not assuming something that's wrong? Uh, same uh, when we are starting work, uh, when we work on the kernel. The problem, again, is because of large amount of out-of-tree code, we have it ourselves uh, in Android common, and uh, but a big chunk of them is also for hardware support. Op Cuddlefish, the the device, ends up solving this problem in a way, but we still have our work to make sure it works uh, out of mainline as is, including all the changes that you need for Android. So I have something that I want, I want to show in terms of the Android parts of the thing. Uh, right, so Android common kernel, thanks to John, Amit, and all the Linaro folks, even our, we, a whole bunch of changes from Android kernel have been merged upstream so far. So what we did for over the year, over the over the past year, is we started from scratch. Uh, our criteria was: what do we really need? What do we really need in order to boot and run Android in this kernel? Because when we started, that kernel had about hundred patch, uh, about eight hundred to thousand patches on top of the kernel latest LTS at the time. So we went through that and we found out when we did 419, it's about 30 patches that you need. Uh, the lines of code changes is there, and we did obviously use Cuttlefish. We haven't found, so that's what you end up needing just to boot. There are a whole bunch of changes and slash features in Android common kernel that I talk about for, uh, at the end that Android ends up using. But in order for uh, a, a, a mainline kernel to basically run Android, that's how many changes you need. Uh, and it shouldn't be much. So our first and foremost is target is to make sure that goes down to zero. Uh, the second, uh, so as part of that, basically, apart from the upstreaming work that everyone else has done, uh, and we've done, what we're also doing is we went through that list and say, uh, there are changes that we've been carrying for about eight to nine years that really, uh, we're not sure if we're used, because the thing with Android, because we never did uh, uh, this for kernel until two years ago, uh, we didn't know, it's the fear where if we end up removing something, what will happen if uh, it will end up breaking someone? So we did uh, a survey of sort with everyone and asked them, hey, do we need uh, device trees to be appended to kernel, for example? No, that drops 10 patches. Do we need XYZ feature that drops 60 patches? And that basically reduced it down to like 200 of them. Uh, and out of them, uh, we found 300 of them are actually, oh sorry, 30 of, about 30 of them are actually needed to boot, which is great. Uh, we still have our work cut out for us in terms of upstreaming. We know uh, the binder priority inheritance patches, I think they've been on the mailing list once. Uh, but that's being worked on. EAS is a big piece that Android Common Kernel has. Uh, that's also being worked on. And SD card FS, which uh, is uh, the one that's used for uh, adaptable storage and uh, apps on Android. And that's probably the biggest one that we uh, that we plan to work on following uh, in the following year in order to make sure uh, our target is to be zero because then we don't want to have to maintain this. Uh, out of three, and I'll talk about that uh, later as well. The backports are still probably going to be around because of the problem that I mentioned earlier, where we still have to continue supporting older kernels. 
Uh, what do we do about out-of-tree out, out of hardware-specific code? Basically, the, uh, uh, well, that explains everything. I'm not, uh, well, I have, uh, but we, I wanted to leave uh, this with a discussion slash question slash an idea. Uh, but uh, before we get there, I wanted to talk about Project Treble and its relations to uh, the Linux kernel and what it ended up doing. So Project Treble introduced in Android Oreo, it did introduce a concept called a vendor in interface, the WinTef line uh, in the diagram basically calls vendor interface. What that means is we basically split uh, Android in two architecturally. The one part that we call framework or interchangeably use framework slash system uh, is something that is to be hardware slash vendor slash uh, any, uh, basically uh, agnostic to hardware. And then, and then anything that lives in that diagram below vendor is the, what Project Treble ended up defining something that depends on uh, hardware. It's not hard, so basically, obviously, hardware abstraction layers became uh, a part of Vintef in that case. But the big piece that became part of Vintef is actually the Linux kernel. Although Linux kernel is something uh, that is hardware dependent. I mean, it does give you support for hardware, but it's not necessarily hardware dependent. Like, it's not necessarily that uh, that has to define its interfaces through a uh, language that we introduced with Project Treble with Hydro. It The Linux kernel interfaces to user space are supposed to be forever, right? So it's not something that we had to worry about versioning and being stable, but and yet it ended up being on the vendor side of things. And the reason for that is simply because of that. Because all of the Android devices have a huge amount of out of tree vendor code. So the deliverable, uh, as much as it is architecture, the deliverable for making an Android device uh, falls on the ODM slash OEM as much as it falls on uh, the hardware maker or the, uh, or the vendor in this case. And that uh, entity is what delivers the Linux kernel to support that give, uh, given hardware. And that's exactly why it ends up being on the other side of Windows. What we would actually like to be is obviously on the platform side where then we can move the platform with the kernel. Uh, as part of Project Treble, what we also introduced is something called as uh, the generic system image. Uh, to give you a brief overview of what uh, generic system image is, is it's basically what proves the Project Treble split. What it does is it, we build, we can build AOSP, the An Android open source uh, code, and create a system image, replace the system image that's on any given Android device with that one, and it boots and it works because that then proves that we've successfully implemented Project Treble. The split has successfully been implemented on that device, and that's actually literally how Project Treble tests are run. We, the, uh, the, the entirety of Andro Android implementation on a given device gets replaced with what we call GSI, and then it passes CTS and VTS tests on top of it. That's the concept of generic system image, and that basically tested uh, the Project Treble requirement. Uh, right, so, I was ahead a bit. So basically, that's what I ended up Project Treble ended up doing. Android is on one side of the split, while the Linux kernel and the vendor implementation of an HAL interface that we defined is on the other side of it. If we want to try and solve the whole hardware specific code being out of tree and try and move the kernel updates with, uh, with uh, try and move kernel with platform, what we want is actually this, which we want things generic, where that GSI being the generic system image, and Project Treble already has set up the ways for doing the tests and doing and making uh, sure this can happen operationally and logistically, where a generic kernel that we release, hopefully just an upstream mainline kernel, can run on any given Android device, provided uh, the hardware whatever uh, specific code guarantees to a stable or slash an interface. Uh, and this doesn't necessarily have to be something that goes on through the device to an user, but it's something that we can use to test. It's something that we can use via Project Treble to make sure every single Android device adheres to this. So then not only just Cuttlefish is something that can run a kernel or a generic kernel, it can be any given device. Uh, 
obviously, how do we get there? A whole bunch of things. And, uh, kernel symbol namespaces is just something that started showing up on the uh, mailing list as well. This is basically to try and uh, figure out how many, how scattered is the internal kernel symbols uh, usage across subsystems, and also limit it for potentially going forward. Uh, the compiler, because the compiler for single compiler for Android. Android itself uses the single compiler, but kernel is an open story right now. It can be GCC or Clang. And monitor the in-kernel ABI, because now we have these this, this path to communicate with everyone in order to tell them if we pretty much have a weekly kernel release per se, uh, we can probably tell everyone, hey, this is the LTS update, we've tried our best, but this is the, how the ABI has changed between the kernel, can make sure whatever code you probably will uh, get affected by it, you've adjusted to it. Or try best possible in order to not change that ABI when the uh, when those uh, kernels are being released, to, uh, when those release notes are being sent to the uh, partners. Uh, process updates, uh, obviously we are trying very hard to make sure everything goes upstream first. We've, uh, you'll notice, uh, you'll notice uh, uh, a few of the things that we've been working on have already shown upstream, whether it's uh, F2FS for checkpoints, there are patches that uh, showed up for the symbol namespaces, there are patches that showed up for uh, device mapper target, uh, the backup on write, for example. Uh, We've, we were also doing something that, uh, in terms of security bugs, where they were you know, embargoed and would show up in common, for example, common kernel before they actually show up upstream. That's been reversed now, and uh, we actively basically end up reporting them to uh, 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 upstream first and make, make sure we fix it upstream and then take them uh, downstream through LTS kernel updates as much as possible. Uh, and basically, we've been testing, monitoring and testing all the cha uh, all of the kernel changes, whether it's merges from our Android uh, with Next Stable on ARM hardware, and same with Cuttlefish as well. Uh, there are more updates on what we've been doing up, things like the user space low memory killer, checkpoints that I talked about, uh, AshMem and Ion, another thing that is in the kernel, but it's in staging. We want to figure out how we can uh, make sure uh, Android is going to be okay if we take Ashby mode or basically replace it with something else. Uh, DRM KMS is another thing. Uh, Android's use of device three was highly controversial last year. I have a bunch of updates regarding that that I, uh, I'm planning to talk about tomorrow. And uh, Android resizable partition. These are this is all basically targeting to make sure Android also gets more and more updates, both in kernel as well as for platform. So uh, anyone interested, be, be sure to show up at Android MC. Uh, and that's tomorrow, I think. And that's pretty much it. That's all I have. No question for questions. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Hey, uh, any guides or any like any documentation on using Cuttlefish? Uh, showing up on uh, android.com soon. The person you should talk to to know more, obviously, is uh, Alistair and me even if you want. Uh, but yes, we're working on that. That's going to show up on android.com soon. All right, thank you. Um, did I understand correctly that Android only has 30 patches that are not upstream? Yes. Well, 30 patches that are required, that are needed to boot Android, and they're not upstream yet. They're in Android Common Core. If you want, and then there, are, then there's ES, there's SD card FS. Uh, I think there's a binder patch, and I'm sure I'm probably missing a couple of them. But what this exercise was to try and figure out what's the minimum that we need. Uh, and that, with those 30 patches, I think we boot Cuttlefish, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. What? Uh, I don't know because I think the way that we need to frame it is the minimum number of patches, not just to boot, but for but for CTS compliance. And I think the number is probably going to be pretty close to thirty anyway. Yes, because number of boot is CTS compliance. Yes. All right. So you talked about the generic kernel image with the out of tree hardware support stuff pushed into 
presumably proprietary binary blob modules. What, what's being done to move that hardware support mm -hmm. into the mainline kernel as well? Do we have any hope for that? Uh, well, your knowledge is as good as mine. <laughs> uh, basically, well, we don't, I don't want to say proprietary. It's, it's kernel. It's CPL. It's all open. Even if they're kernel modules, they're, uh, they will be open. What the generic kernel image does is basically now, for example, it would make sure those kernel modules, A, those device drivers can be modules or must be modules. You can't depend on uh, a kernel that's basically changed internally just so a particular driver would work. That can't happen anymore. You can't export any symbols that you want because that's how the driver is written. That can't happen anymore because, remember, all of those drivers have to work with a generic kernel image that we want to be able to build and test any given device with, right? Because now all of those, uh, I'm pretty sure I've seen kernels where things get intertwined so much that there's literally a cyclic dependency of drivers. And then if you make them as kernel modules, it doesn't even boot because it, no matter which driver you load first, it's not going to work. Uh, and so those, all of those problems stop happening. So now what that means is, Sure, if you're shipping an Android device to a user, just to, let's say, if that increases boot time, you may even choose to build that module or driver in the kernel in order to basically continue to work. But, in or, but by having this test, which has to work with a generic kernel image, for example, that same driver has to be able to build and boot as kernel modules, which automatically makes it much more upstream ready than what it would have been before. So the uh, so hope is it's a natural progression. But, uh, but uh, well, yeah, apart from that, it's like I said, it's your knowledge is as much as good as mine in that case. Well, I have yes. a question. Uh, how do we motivate OEMs and ODMs who are uh, basically shipping products to, to, to follow this? Is there any way that you, uh, that you have in mind to force of sorts with the future uh, AOSP releases? Well, with Android releases, we've done the minimum kernel version thing. If we do end up doing uh, the GK, and, and of course, I, we need help, because we, for example, we're starting this research right now. For One of the biggest requirement for a generic kernel image is A, is kernel, or let's say even ARM64 kernels today are ready to be generic. Like for, I, we started doing this. I still don't know if all subsystem, for all subsystems, we can have drivers that get plugged into a running kernel, for example. I, uh, I've covered about four of them, and they all seem to be fine, but this has to be at the beginning of SOC, which is right at the beginning of your boot cycle. But there are steps taken already in order to basically go on this path with the kernel version, uh, with the GSI for Android in this case, that takes care of Android. If we do the kernel part, uh, then that also moves the kernel in that way as well. Because those tests, remember, they have to be uh, they are. They have to be passed if you launch an Android device. In that case. Okay, going going to the part where we were talking with the um, vendor portion of the uh, Tribble. Now, one of the things we we uh, deal with quite a lot is with the um, the request API of the cameras. Um, that's currently in the user space. It's not in the kernel space, but it's going into the kernel space. So, we I kind of hope that with the request API going into the kernel space, that some of this this vendor space can shrink, because right now, the camera section of the kernel is one of the, one of the things that has to be outside in the vendor space, because it's user space. And, that's, and it, it's not part of the kernel at this time. Right. Uh, I'm not familiar with what you're saying in terms of request API. Oh, request API is, is part of the HAL3 um, inf infrastructure implementation of how the camera frames are requested from, from okay. the, uh, through the pipeline. So basically, okay. you, you request the format you want in advance and it delivers it as opposed to working as a streaming pipeline. Okay. Well, if I'm understanding you correctly, you're basically trying to keep that API stable so you can move uh, along? It's currently, uh, it's currently um, not part of the next kernel at this point. It's uh -huh. only in it uh, 420. Okay. That is exactly why, for example, it can, I can, you can draw an analogy with that with, for example, DRM-KMS. Uh, the display, 
with uh, Android is there, are FB, there is FBDEV implementation, there's a DRM KMS as well. If we standardize that in order to make sure, yes, so if you, if you make the HALs smaller and smaller in the point that there is no need, that's basically when you have a very stable kernel interface which Android can directly rely on. That's where we want to be, definitely. Yes. What, if anything, changed uh, for Treble between 8 and 9? With uh, Android 9? Yeah. Uh, many things. With respect to kernel, there are more tests. There are more, uh, there are changes in terms of how verified boot uh, works, but only in the device tree. There are user space changes with respect to properties. There are things that were left, uh, well, not left, that were uh, kind of unfinished in terms of the separation from platform to vendor, and all of that was plugged with uh, Android 9, I think. So Android 9 is more, much more complete, maybe, can I say fully complete? Then, oh. yes, yes. I think we're uh, done with this one. Thank All you very right. much. Perfect. Thank you. Great, great, great.